I'm Jeffrey Crawford, coordinator for this rulemaking, speaking in support of LD 1772 for the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm here to present this provisionally adopted rule of the Board of Environmental Protection and request your adoption. In 2011, the Maine Legislature passed Public Law 2011, Chapter 653, an act to improve environmental oversight and streamline permitting for metallic mineral mining in Maine, which directed the Department to amend its existing mining rules to clarify the application requirements for metallic mineral exploration and advanced exploration activities and to adopt major substantive rules to modernize Maine's mining requirements and reduce the number of separate environmental permits necessary for environmental activities by January 10th, 2014. In addition to updating a number of mining related laws, Public Law 2011, Chapter 653, also established the Maine Metallic Mineral Mining Act, which provides a statutory framework governing metallic mineral mining activities in Maine, including the administration and enforcement rules and local jurisdiction requirements, mining permit application procedures, mining permit duration, termination, revocation, transfer, and amendment procedures, performance, operation, and reclamation standards, financial assurance requirements, mining and reclamation reporting requirements, and enforcement and violation provisions. The department initiated rulemaking activities to, up, to update and amend the exploration and advanced exploration permitting requirements in its existing mining rules in 2012. This routine technical rulemaking provided specific application, permitting, and performance requirements for individuals seeking to conduct exploration or advanced exploration activities. The department completed this rulemaking in March of 2013. The formal rulemaking process for the major substantive mining rules began in mid-September when the department presented its proposal to the Board of Environmental Protection and requested that a public hearing be held on October 17, 2013. During the October 17th public hearing, the board heard testimony from a number of consultants, interested parties, and the general public. Additional comments were received during the written comment period, which closed on October 28, 2013. Beginning in early November, the board held four deliberative sessions on the proposal to discuss key issues raised by commenters. At the board's request, the department prepared draft language incorporating the board's suggestions from these deliberative suggest uh, sessions, including amending the proposal to allow mining and groundwater under waters of the state and in freshwater wetlands, requiring the disclosure of all entities with a financial interest in the proposed activity, explicitly allowing wet waste management techniques, revising the financial assurance requirements to allow the use of an irrevocable letter of credit to fund the financial assurance mechanism and allowing incremental funding of the financial assurance mechanisms with full funding prior to the extraction of any ore, eliminating the prohibition against mining on public reserve lots and reducing the mining setback from certain resources to one quarter mile, requiring that all discharges to affected areas meet applicable water quality standards as soon as practicable, but in no case greater than 30 years, with the exception of wet waste management units, and instituting explicit air quality requirements. The board posted these changes to an additional written comment period, ending on December 23, 2013. On January 10, 2014, the board reviewed a number of changes that were made to the proposal in response to public comments, and after receiving additional oral comments on the proposal pursuant to Title 38, Section 341H3C, deliberated and voted to provisionally adopt the Department's proposal with several additional changes identified by board members. These changes included allowing certain types of waste rock to be used for roads and other construction purposes, prohibiting surface mining within one mile of certain resources unless it can be demonstrated to the department's satisfaction that a distance of not less than one quarter mile 
is sufficiently protective of the resource, the environment, and public health, and allowing additional time for a wet waste, wet mine waste management unit to meet water quality standards only if it is the most practicable alternative for waste management. The provisionally adopted rule provides a comprehensive framework for implementing the Maine Metallic Mineral Mining Act and provides for the protection of natural resources, including surface and groundwater, in accordance with statutory requirements. Before I close, I would like to thank the members of the board of the department's mining team for all their efforts. Mark Stebbins, our mining coordinator, Stacy Ladner, hazardous waste regulation, David Burns, solid waste regulation, John Holpeck, senior geologist, Bill Henkel, water quality regulation, and Tracy Kelly, uncontrolled sites. The mining team members will be available for the work session, if at all possible. Thank you for your consideration allowing this testimony, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Uh, Senator Saviello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Jeff. Quick question. In reviewing your response to comments, you often reference the Global Acid Rock Drainage Guidelines. Can you just have a copy, bring a copy over here, just drop it off with our, our uh, clerk? I'd like to look through that if I could. Other questions? Yes, Representative Harlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just curious how long the department has had a mining team. <coughs> The mining team was formed uh, in an effort to craft these rules, uh, so the team got together uh, oh, about a year okay. right at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Campbell. Yes, uh, uh, quarter mile has been mentioned a few times, uh, reducing the mining set bad for certain resources to quarter mile, um, and, and then a little bit later. Uh, how did we come to a quarter mile, and uh, do you feel that's significant or sufficient to protect Maine waters? The setback requirements representative were determined by the Board of Environmental Protection, uh, and it was their, their finding that, in fact, uh, a quarter mile, in some cases at least, would, would be sufficiently protected. Uh, the actual rule, again, requires a one-mile setback uh, unless it can be demonstrated that a lesser distance is, is adequately protective. Follow-up? So I'm clear. <clears throat> Generally, it's one mile. Yes. But one quarter might be accepted if proven. That is correct, Representative. And, in fact, the rule also uh, has a provision that if a greater setback distance is, appro is appropriate and necessary, uh, that could be established also. If I could follow up just to clarify, too, um, in my, and I did attend the hearings and the board hearing, and it's my recollection that one mile is the, the requirement. The only, as I recall, the only reason that was given it uh, would be for topo topographic reasons, that, it, that if the topo topography were protective, that the one mile could be re reduced to a quarter mile. Not, I don't recall other reasons, so it would have to be specific to topography, as I recall. Is that correct? The uh, topography, Senator, was uh, the one issue, I guess, if you will, that was discussed, whether there would be other, other situations where it could be reduced. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have the language in front of me, but that's the way I remember yeah. reading it. So we'll, we'll get to that in the work session. Other, I saw other hands down here. Representative McGowan. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had three related questions. One is, um, <clears throat> who did the department hire to help it with its uh, formulation of these rules? How much money were they paid for that? And where did that funding come from? The department contracted with an engineering and environmental consulting firm. Uh, uh, by the name of North Jackson, their competitive bidding process. Uh, they came on board and were uh, began development of the draft rules in late January of last year. Uh, the actual contract, uh, I would have to get back to you with an exact number. It was approximately $150,000. So I can provide you the, the actual number. 
last part of the question was where did that funding come from? I'll have to get back to you on that also. Thank you. Representative Reed. Sir, would you say that the rules as written reflect the comments and uh, concerns addressed during the hearings? The board's rules reflect the board's findings uh, with respect to all of the comments that were submitted, yes. Then why, uh, why all the concern about the rules, sir? There's a lot of opposition to mining in general. Follow up, Representative Reed. No. Representative Harlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I sort of have a follow up. Um, would you say that the rules reflect um, the intent in LD 1853? Absolutely, they Representative. Do. Okay, thank you. For those listening, LD 1853 for reference was the Mining Act passed by in the 125th legislature. Not everybody knows all the numbers, but you were here, so you know it well. Um, Representative Cooper, thank you. Thank you. Um, with respect to the change in the rule uh, uh, allowing, in some circumstances, a um, quarter of a mile rather than a full mile uh, of distance from a certain resources, um, as I read your this paragraph here, the change came from the Board of Environmental Protection, is that right? That is correct, Representative. But the usual order of uh, the process is that DEP proposes the rule, it goes to BEP, and then to us, is that correct? That is also correct. Um, what experts does DEP have to uh, to uh, help them formulate uh, uh, scientifically based uh, regulations? Well, uh, the members of the mining team together have, oh, 125 years plus experience. Uh, and even beyond the mining team, we have a, a wide range of hydrogeologists, uh, solid waste people, hazardous waste people. My question had to do with the Board of Environmental Protection. Yes. The but board the mining team is DEP, right? That is correct. So are so you saying D, uh, BEP used DEP uh, expert, experts? Yes. The, the, board, the Board of Environmental Protection relies upon the department for technical work. So they don't work independently of DEP? In a major substantive rulemaking such as this, the board could direct the department to make changes as they deem appropriate, and in fact, they did. So, do you know what the testimony was, uh, or, or was there testimony that supported this rule change? There was testimony both in support of uh, a lesser distance. Uh, the department's initial proposal uh, that we. Uh, posted, if you will, to public hearing and comment back in September, uh, actually had a one-mile setback from from certain resources. Uh, during the public comment period and the board's deliberations, uh, they directed us to actually reduce that to one quarter mile. And then, in response to public comments received during the second comment period, uh, the board made changes to. Uh, amend it again where we have essentially a one mile setback with one quarter mile in, in certain cases. Yes, follow up, President, President Cooper. Uh, I know you can't do it off the cuff, but can you identify the uh, testimony that was presented uh, that uh, uh, urged uh, the change uh, that we're discussing at the work session? We, we will work, we will, we, will, we will talk about that with you. Thank you. We, we do have in our packets, we have um, comments that were presented to the board in the comment period. Right, but I'm... It's I, hard I, to dig it out, I though. haven't read them I know. all yet. I just got them. <laughs> Understood. I'm not sure whether or not it specifically um, sets forth uh, 
comments that went to this particular rule change. Thank you. Yep. Uh, other, lots of other hands. Representative Grant, and then I'll go back to the right side. I saw her hand earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Crawford. You. And um, again, I would, I, I know members of your mining team. You have an exceptional group of professionals, and um, I thank them for the work they did that was in exactly in accordance with what the previous um, law was. Um, my question is similar to um, Representative Cooper's. So you, you're saying, would you, would you characterize these, the changes that the BEP made as substantial changes to what the DEP presented in their draft? Would you characterize them as substantial changes? During the deliberal, deliberative session, the board directed some changes that were, in fact, sent out for additional public comment. Uh, ch any changes made uh, subsequent to that point in time, uh, the board and an assistant attorney general uh, did discuss whether or not they were significant changes and uh, ultimately voted to adopt this, this proposal or this provisionally adopt the rules as you see them. Can I have a follow-up, please? Sure. And, and so, though the DEP, the department, hired a consultant to assist them, outside expertise was deemed to be required to develop the rules that you presented to the BEP, but the BEP did not consult any outside experts outside of the department to make the alterations that they made? Were there any mining experts um, outside the DEP that were, were, were utilized? The board worked with the department solely. Senator Gratwick. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, um, sir, thank you again very much. Uh, question on uh, finances, subchapter 417A. Uh, the question about um, funding uh, for whether it be a bond or a quote, full funding, as you note on your revised question, um, on your revised statement here, uh, who determines what the proper funding should be uh, for uh, cleanup costs? Oh, is that a group within your uh, within your department? Because I noticed that there's no one here, at least on your list of six people that has financial, <coughs> at least you don't list their financial expertise. How are we sure that we have the best um, data of what this is going to cost in the, in the, in the future? And <coughs> that um, how do we ensure that the, this can't, under six, they can't be discharged through bankruptcy, the permittee, um, and how, what are your thoughts and your considerations about, quote, incremental uh, funding as opposed to funding up front? Okay, Senator, it's a, a long question with a lot of, lot of issues. Uh, with respect to the review of the financial assurance uh, application, if you will, uh, that would be reviewed by the department uh, in concert with uh, individuals that have documented experience uh, for example, in material handling, construction, mining costs, financial analysis. Uh, we actually do have quite a lot of expertise in-house in with uh, the development and administration of financial assurance mechanisms as they relate to hazardous waste materials uh, in landfills. Uh, specifically with mining, uh, even though there's a similarity, uh, we would anticipate that, in fact, we would hire a third-party uh, individuals or experts to help us with this. The rules, in fact, uh, do uh, recognize that we may hire third parties. It is not an absolute requirement. And uh, I'm <laughs> more than happy to continue on with the rest of that. You want to restate for him, Senator? Thank you. Uh, surely. And then the I'm always going to be I'm going to be curious as the how one finally comes to the final note, because if I'm a mining company, I'm going to want to have a put in relatively little money. If I'm a person living next door, I'm going to want to have them put in a large amount of money to make sure it's working. And how does how does one come to that determination of what is a fair amount uh, so you don't have these, quote, incremental funding uh, patterns? Within the, the application process, a mining applicant would have to uh, document in his plan uh, a proposal for that financial assurance. There are contingency measures built in there. 
uh, the financial assurance mechanisms uh, would need to cover uh, closure costs, reclamation costs, post-closure costs, any corrective actions. Uh, we will have uh, people at the at the work sessions that can speak with some some great detail on that for you. Thank you. Just a final follow-up. So I'm going to be very interested in the work session, the specifics of that, how it's been done elsewhere, what kinds of monies you're talking about in order to keep mine XYZ okay. uh, appropriately bonded. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Campbell, you I saw your hand. It's not, uh, Representative McGowan and then Senator Saviello. Um, <clears throat> yes, could you explain what the reasoning was? Uh, my understanding from people is the area probably of most concern in this whole mining area is that of impact on water quality. So what was the reasoning that would allow up to 30 years of treatment of water and a mine design? The 30-year the uh, time threshold was chosen because it's consistent with thresholds under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, RECRA, for hazardous waste. So it's a, it is an existing, uh, commonly utilized uh, period of time that uh, has a technical basis. Follow-up? Second question I have is, is about language. So there are statements here about <clears throat> water quality meeting standards. And is that any different than the water quality being the same at the end as when we started? In other words, I don't understand what may be the subtle implications that say, hey, you know, this water quality meets standards, but by the way, it's been altered quite a bit from the way it originally was. I'm going to defer that to the work session when I can have a water quality expert with us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Saviello. Jeff, thanks for all your good work on this. Jeff, I just went through this, uh, the questions and answers that were posed during the hearing, um, and I was very impressed. Did you answer all of the questions that were posed by the various uh, uh, testimony to the best of your knowledge during uh, as, as you've noted that there are volumes of comments uh, believe all of the, all of the comments and concerns were in fact answered and addressed uh, we did miss several people and, and they were omitted from the basis statement and uh, did just recently sent out a correction to that note thank you other uh, representative Ayat had a question yeah, Mr. Crawford, uh, you're the uh, coordinator for rulemaking. Do you feel, in, uh, <clears throat> and I read along with you, do you feel that the DEP has been given sufficient autonomy or authority? Absolutely. To, I didn't finish my question yet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, deal with all or, or, or to take care of all the problems that may arise in mining so that uh, water quality, runoff, all the concerns. Do you feel the DEP has sufficient knowledge, ability, um, oversight to handle all of the problems that many, that many of the people tell me about or email me about or many of the much of the public here is I, I want to give you a chance to come right out and say yes we are on top of everything we do have the ability to and and if these people trust the DEP to do their job and I believe I believe the DEP is doing their job why wouldn't we rest assured that all of the uh, problems that may arise will be properly addressed and do you my question is do you feel you have the proper rulemaking the proper authority the proper ability to handle all the environmental problems that may come along so that this project can go forward I believe we have developed a rule that meets the intent of LD uh, 18 uh, 1853 I believe it was that established mining framework law. Uh, we have sufficient expertise to address most every issue. If that isn't a particularly comforting answer, 
I would like to note that uh, the mining application fee for a permit application uh, is up to $500,000. And we have authority to use some of that application fee as necessary uh, to hire any needed or necessary third party individuals to help in any assessment. So whatever expertise we may lack within the department, we can augment that through the application fee. Okay. Thank you. A couple quick ones. I just want to clarify, and maybe you'll need to bring these in for the work session to help out a little bit. Uh, one of the things in the rules, it, it talked about that um, only municipal interveners were allowed to conduct mine sites and not citizen interveners. Was there a reason for that? And, and I just asked those questions. Jeff, you can certainly bring them into the work session. That sure. would be helpful to me. Okay. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, yes, yes, Senator. I, I can answer them briefly, and we'll go yep. into some more detail at the work session. Uh, the Metallic Mineral Mining Act established an intervener status for municipalities and county commissioners. That's what we have incorporated in these rules. Uh, Non-municipality or county commissioner interveners, uh, their intervention status would be governed, and public participation status would be governed by the department's existing Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 rules. So it's already covered then. Yes, what you're suggesting. Um, the uh, there seems to be some concern that these rules exempt them from a soil stabilization and erosion control guidelines. And, and again, if yes, if yes, if yes, yes, is a, we we will we will be happy to provide a little more detail on that at the work session. The short answer is. Uh, they do not incorporate explicit, explicitly that you adhere to the uh, soil and erosion control stabilization guidelines because those guidelines are not regulations, they are not rules. So since they have not been through a public participation process, we cannot incorporate them. But, but we're still going to hold them to those guidelines? Yes. And then... Um, it, it seems to be some concern that uncertified individuals can perform a technical <coughs> analysis, design, and construction of the mines. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I, uh, to both counts, uh, there does seem to be some concern. Uh, and also, uh, the rules allow for qualified professionals. Uh, during both the routine technical update of our existing rules and the major substantive rulemaking, uh, we received comments from individuals pointing out that uh, a wetland scientist, for, for example, may not have a professional certification uh, or, or any, any number of disciplines. They certainly are experts, but uh, the, to require a licensed individual would preclude uh, many people. You might have a licensed professional engineer, but in other disciplines there's no corresponding uh, professional certification or licensing requirement. So they may well, in fact, have a certification, like a wetland scientist, for example, but yes. may not be might be licensed as such. Exactly. So and it's, it's a totally uncertified individual, the department is not going to take that into consideration. And 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 the rules provide that the department can review an individual's credentials prior to accepting their work. Thank you. Yes, Representative Cooper. Thank you. Um, you list two uh, changes that were um, uh, made to the rules by the BEP um, following the public hearings that the DEP had, uh, accepted. Um, the waste rock, uh, used, certain types of waste rock could be used for roads and the uh, quarter mile distance in some circumstances that we've talked about. Oh, and the third one, um, wet mine waste management. Um, were there any other changes besides these three? There were a <coughs> number of, of other changes made in response to the department, or, or in response to comments throughout the department's proposal. Uh, I would have to get back to you. I don't believe uh, well, yes, the answer is yes. The board did, in fact, direct additional changes beyond those three. Okay. And I, I, I will have those for you at the work session. Thank you. And so I, I would make the same request as I did uh, earlier with respect to any changes that were added 
post uh, public hearing that you, if possible, can identify the uh, public comments or other information that BEP relied upon and DP accepted as a justification for those changes. We'll try to do that for you. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Saviello? Well, just one more. I want to just clarify one thing because I've heard mixed messages about public lands. Jeff, is the present law that allows actually mining on public lands? The existing Chapter 200 that would be repealed and replaced is, is silent on the issue. So it does not address it at all. Uh, the uh, provisionally adopted rule establishes these setbacks and prohibitions for certain high-value high resources. The uh, Public Law 2011, Chapter 653, uh, did in fact direct the department to uh, assess, uh, you know, prohibitions or restrictions for historic sites and other high-value resources. Uh, I'm not sure. Did that answer your question? No, but we can. I want to try to okay. clean that for the work yep. session. Yeah, we can talk about the work session. Because I've been told that the public, I, I, I will do it for the work session. Okay. I, I have a number of questions. Um, I had way more, but they, many of them have been answered. So, um, and, and s I'll just touch on them and probably as I go, maybe identify that I'd like to hear more at work session just for. Right. Um, and I'll start, I guess I'll skip right to that one because um, as I recall, the provision um, the, regarding the one mile setback, what the board ultimately adopted, as I recall, is that public reserved lots would be exempted, not all public reserved lands. And that is so, correct, sir. So the works, either, if you can quickly describe that now, that would be helpful, but also some written some, uh, materials, that further, further details on the distinction between public reserved lands, like you just described for historic sites, et cetera, and public reserved lots. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, the department's uh, original proposal would have uh, prohibited or uh, prohibited mining on and also established a setback from all public reserved lands and lots. Uh, during the public comment period, there were commenters that noted that, you know, there are public reserve lots, often, oftentimes small parcels, uh, scattered throughout uh, throughout the state of Maine, and that uh, a de facto one mile setback from them would essentially prohibit mining over, I've heard, 20 percent of the state or, or greater. Uh, in response to that, uh, the board adopted a change that would restrict it to only restricting or establishing that one mile setback from a public reserve land. And the uh, statutory reference in there, uh, I think it's Title 12, Section 180. Uh, is intended to still prohibit mining on or establish that one mile setback from public reserve lands, but uh, not afford that same protection for public reserve lots. Right. So, what I thank you for that general explanation. What I would like for the work session is more specifics on the effect of that change that the board made. I understand, and now we all do, I think, the distinction to some extent generally, but. I want more specifics on what you mean by that well 20 percent you know the one mile and and the specific I, I read that that provision as well but I didn't find the distinction between lots and lands and so that's what I'd like more information on that okay. um, also more um, information on how the board determined um, to allow the use of an irrevocable letter of credit that they added that um, again not necessarily for today but for work session um, just so you know, that's where my thinking is, at least. Um, and, I, and I related to that, a description of the allowance for incremental funding. Um, and I sat through the hearings and the board deliberations. So I, sure. I have personally a general sense of what okay. the discussion was, but I want more specifics sure. from the department and for committee members to have for work session so that we can get into that in uh, more detail. Um, Uh, and then your second to last paragraph, F, where you listed these things I'm looking at. Uh, F was requiring all discharges to affected areas meet applicable water quality standards as soon as practicable. Um, some more discussion, either now, if you can do it briefly, or at work session, um, what the board determined were affected areas. 
you want to go touch on it work now? Work sessions. Just, okay. Um, and then back to the financing. I mean, and I would like you to touch on this one now because okay. I thought I remembered reading that there was a provision when the financial assurance mechanisms were to be determined by the department or ultimately as, as a condition of the permit. I thought there was an, uh, a provision for an additional 15% above the full estimated cost. There is. It's part I haven't of the, heard that in the testimony. Or it, is, it is part of the contingency requirements that are built in there. Okay. So just so that the committee knows and the public knows that um, there's that 15% provision and some description when you come back of how that number was arrived at and, and so that we can, or at least I can formulate some thoughts on wh whether that's an appropriate amount. Um, and then some, this would be helpful in a, a minute or two today, if you would, on, um, you have a description of the department initiated rulemakings to update and amend exploration and advanced exploration uh, as routine technical, and then um, major substantive for, um, for the rest. So you made a, the department made a determination on routine technical that it would apply to exploration and advanced exploration. Can you talk about the distinction that the department made, or was it? Uh, yeah, I guess it was the department that made that distinction. Correct. Yes, the uh, center, the routine technical rulemaking was conducted by the department, so would not be reviewed by. by uh, and in fact, it updated our uh, existing chapter 200 to have. Uh, explicit requirements for exploration and advanced exploration activities. Our existing Chapter 200 uh, basically uh, address those activities on a case-by-case -case basis with, with neither any uh, true performance standards or uh, uh, technical standards in it. So uh, what this did was actually put some, some performance standards out there. Uh, and in fact, the uh, routine technical update, those standards were very similar to what was ultimately included in the, the board's provisionally adopted rule. Right. I just want some more fleshing out, if you will, from the department when, when we get to that, not okay. to take up the time today, because I think it can, that's likely to be a lengthy conversation, at least in my mind, is, and that's, there may be some clarification if you describe, the department describes that distinction that you made in your determination between routine technical and major substantive that would illuminate some of the other decisions that were made later on by the board. I, I think there may have been others that substantive determinations made by the board and the assistant AG, but um, we'll, I'd like to step through both the distinctions first that the department made on routine technical and then later um, how the, you know, some length, not today, but for discussion of the major substantive um, determinations. Yes, Senator Saviel. That's all I have for now. Just to, uh, on the water quality, as they come in, and again, I know you're not in a position to, but how do you address the fact that background levels might be greater? And so if we're bringing it back to water quality standards, for example, if arsenic is already at 300 parts per million, are they required to clean it up more than that? That's something, maybe you have it now, but if not, certainly at the work session would be helpful, for, I think, for this committee. Actually, Senator, uh, the, the uh, provisionally adopted rule does define contamination in accordance with the statutory definition the legislature adopted, and uh, it would be, uh, um, let me read this to you if you, if you, if you will indulge me. Uh, contamination, as applied to groundwater, contamination means non-attainment of water quality standards the cause of which is attributable to a mining operation as specified in rules related to primary drinking water standards adopted pursuant to 22 MRS 2611, what we usually think of, drinking water standards, or B, demonstrated by a statistically significant change in measured parameters that indicates deterioration of water quality determined through assessment monitoring. In other words, if the groundwater is already uh, contaminated uh, above and beyond drinking water standards, already not fit for drinking water standards, uh, contamination would be measured as a worsening of that, of that groundwater. Other questions? Representative Campbell. Is there a requirement to have existings before anything occurs? Testing? Of the quality? Yes. Yep. Other questions for the department? Yes, Representative McGowan. Yes. 
Um, just quickly looking at North Jackson Engineering, could you bring to the work session more background information about <coughs> their experience and expertise with mining? Uh, and quickly looking at the information, the word mining is not used anywhere in the company's description. So I'm curious about that. Okay. Thank you. We will. We, I, for, I have was referring to your testimony, not my notes, and I had questions about the previous testimony we heard. Um, one presenter said that this, these rules would allow contamination beyond the mining site. Can you describe, how, in your view, for the department, how, how somebody could <clears throat> conceive that the rules would allow contamination beyond the mining site? I don't see the rules allowing contamination beyond the mining site. The rules provide uh, stringent standards to prevent the release of contamination contaminants to both groundwater and surface water. The statutory requirements are that there be no, no discharges to surface water, either on a mining site or off, off in, on a mining area or outside of the mining area. The rules do not, or excuse me, the rules uh, and the statute do not require that the groundwater immediately underneath a mining area meet the applicable standards. So for someone to say that they allow contamination off the site, uh, I'm not sure how, how you would reach that conclusion. Is it maybe they're thinking that where the mining excavation occurs is the mining site and where the treatment occurs is, I, I don't know, just something different? In other words, in your applicant, as I read it, an applicant to the department is going to have to define the mining area. It may be the interpretation that the mining area would be larger than what's excavated or even larger than, than what's treated and therefore the contamination could spread beyond the excavation or treatment, but maybe not to the perimeter of what you define as the mining area? The, the board received a lot of comments uh, with respect to the uh, definition and clarification of the concept of a mining area. Uh, the, ultimately, the provisionally adopted rules, we believe, did clarify uh, what is meant by a mining area, but uh, I'd be happy to discuss that with you in greater detail during the work session. That was going to be my suggestion, too, because we had a lot of discussion last year yeah. about that, and we still have comments, and there was discussion before many of us even arrived here about that. So, And um, also, <laughs> could you give the department's perception of whether these rules would need EPA review that, as was described, is typically done? Do you have a view on whether that's typical or wh why that was is not being done? These rules do not need an EPA, I mean, I guess first, first of all, point of clarification, EPA did in fact uh, review these draft rules and did in fact submit comments and uh, uh, we made several changes with, with, uh, in an effort to address their comments. Those comments were restricted to the relation to other rules. On page 10 of the provisionally adopted rules, uh, you'll see that uh, compliance with this chapter does not prevent an applicant or a permittee from having to meet all other requirements, whether it be a waste discharge license, uh, they would have to have a Natural Resources Protection Act permit for activities affecting uh, uh, those resources. They would have to have uh, meet all federal requirements for federally delegated programs, such as the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. Uh, okay. And are the, the the EPA comments in our submission packet? Yes, they are. Okay. If you could, uh, do you know exactly where they are? You said page ten of the. I, I I I will I will find them for you and make sure. The, the changes would be on page 10 of the provisionally adopted rule, and uh, I'll make sure we have EPA's comments for you. Okay, and, do you, and so that was, those comments were, EPA comments were during the drafting by the department of the rules? During, right? during the, the rulemaking process, yes. I, I may have misspoke. I'm not sure that they are in the basis statement. If not, I'll provide them to you. 
And were they with respect to only the routine technical or also? Uh, no, they were they were with respect to the major substantive rules. And routine technical as well? No. Just major substantive. Okay, thank you. Other uh, questions? I, I just clarification. Yes, Chairman. You're, the, e the EPA reviewed the changes that the uh, the board made, correct? Not the DEP uh, before the rules went to the board. During uh, Representative the EPA, our discussions and uh, changes that we made in response to EPA's concerns were during the rulemaking. So they would have been uh, post public hearing before the rules were provisionally adopted. Thank you. And they were they were restricted primarily to the relationship to other other federal federally delegated programs. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Other questions? Mr. Crawford. Seeing none, thank you. Thank That's you. All we have for today. Um,